I'm going to move on to my speech, which is about breast biomarkers. Uh, and there have been a few changes recently, and I'd like to just give an overview of what is happening in biomarkers in breast cancer over the last couple of years. And I'm going to bring the clinical implications uh, into this biomarker talk, uh, because I think that it, we should be um, practicing medicine that is um, targeted as much as possible um, to the individual patient as our number of breast cancer subtypes expands. Um, I have some disclosures uh, and a brief agenda. Uh, and I'm going to cover these topics um, not sequentially, but all uh, they'll be intercalated. So the times are changing, uh, and there are a variety of uh, implications to those changes. But I'm going to go back to the original target that we had in cancer, being the estrogen receptor. Now, this has been known about for quite some time. Uh, it remains the mainstay of our subtyping uh, in breast cancer. And, uh, an estrogen receptor positive tumour of more than or equal to 1% staining of the number of cells on IHC is positive. Uh, however, as has been discussed before, 1 to 10% is actually closer in its behaviour to being negative. And it's the proportion of tumour cells that stain as well as the intensity score. And there's a variety of staining patterns. You might see some heterogeneity. You might see patches of estrogen receptor positivity and patches of negativity. When we do core biopsies initially uh, with breast cancer, the analytic variability is less. And so I would suggest that a core biopsy is actually better for looking at, these, uh, the, at the biomarkers. The progesterone receptor, again, 1% is, on IHC is considered positive. It's a companion to the estrogen receptor as it modulates estrogen receptor alpha expression. A value of less than 20% does correlate with a luminal B phenotype along with higher grade without necessarily looking at key 67 which is quite variable and I'll touch on that a little bit later. But you can see in the panel on the bottom right that in luminal B tumours they're more likely to be progesterone receptor negative or low. A higher progesterone receptor expression is associated with a better prognosis. Now HER2, uh, which is the third of the triple biomarker, which we know and understand well, uh, is according to the ASCO CAP guidelines, IHC 0 or 1 plus is negative. IHC of 3 plus is considered positive. And so an IHC can actually distinguish most of those breast cancer patients without the need for in situ hybridization. Those that are 2 plus, considered equivocal, then proceed to ish, and we can then determine if it's HER2 positive or not. Of course, we know about HER2 low now, and this is a revolution in breast cancer medicine, uh, which has occurred this year. And at the ASCO plenary, uh, there was a standing ovation for the Destiny Breast 04 trial results, and this has given us another option for many of these patients who did not have a targeted therapy if they were estrogen receptor negative. But now, if they have HER2 1 plus or 2 plus, if the 2 plus is ish negative, then that's considered to be HER2 low. But I think that we're going to have to do a lot more work in our determination of the HER2 status so that we can give most patients possible access to these new targeted agents. So there's a prognostic impact of these biomarkers and it's worth knowing about that prognostic impact but it's also most important to know about the predictive impact. So how are these patients going to do in response to therapy? And so we see on the right um, that you, the HER2 positive line is actually on the lower side. And this is prior to HER2-directed agents. And then on the left, the Oxford overview of HER2-directed therapy has seen a significant reduction in the proportion of patients who are experiencing recurrence 
uh, with HER2 positive disease as a result of HER2 directed therapies such as trastuzumab and we now have a plethora of options uh, for those HER2 positive patients. Key 67 is challenging. Key 67 is a prognostic marker. It shows us proliferation of breast cancer uh, and it distinguishes between luminal A and luminal B. Now, there have been various cut points. So the St. Gallen guidelines uh, in around 2013 from memory indicated a 14% cut point. However, I think that is uh, too specific. The Lumina trial had a cut point of 13.25%. Oh, sorry, I'll just go back. Uh, and that's clearly highly specific. However, if you have a key 67 of between 10 and 20%, that is probably intermediate. Less than 10% is probably low, and more than 20% would be considered to be high. There is substantial inter-observer variability in key 67. Uh, and this makes it quite difficult uh, to standardise and to compare between institutions and to say, OK, well, this value, this specific value, tells us that this, is, this patient has luminal B cancer and they require chemotherapy. Uh, and there have been some international efforts that have improved the standardisation of Key67. So bringing those markers all together, um, we have the sub four major subtypes uh, of breast cancer, and then we have gene expression profiles. And those gene expression profiles can then slice and dice a little bit differently uh, in terms of the molecular type. And we've talked about luminal HER2 positive, and then we have normal-like and basal-like. Uh, luminal androgen receptor, uh, Claudin Low, uh, and then that can be split up into a range of triple negative types. And actually, triple negative is defined by the absence of receptors, and that really doesn't help us a great deal because you've got perhaps 10, 20 different types of triple negative breast cancer. Some of them can be distinguished on routine immunohistochemistry. Some of those triple negative breast cancer types are actually very uh, good prognostic and they don't actually need chemotherapy. And I think that we are over-treating some of these patients. The difficulty there is that we need good tools to select them and we need confidence in those tools and we need confidence uh, with our pathology colleagues. So the intrinsic subtype, um, Chuck Peru, back in 2000, um, worked on these um, heat maps uh, to determine the HER2 enriched basal-like, luminal A, luminal B, uh, and that is actually different to what we see with the immunohistochemistry. So those intrinsic subtypes based on uh, the genes within the cancer tell us more about how that patient is likely to respond or not respond to the respective therapies. When we include HER2 low, uh, we can also see um, that there are some changes in uh, the subtypes um, on a molecular basis. Now, I'll move on to uh, what we've seen recently. Uh, and uh, I think that um, Dr. Dizon and Professor Mannering's uh, talks lead into this quite well. Uh, I'm not going to talk about uh, this for too long because Professor Mannering will be talking about the antibody drug conjugates a little bit later on. So HER2 low, as I mentioned, uh, is a target for trastuzumab druxtecan. And that has a high antibody to drug ratio. So you've got one antibody with eight approximately of the chemotherapy drugs attached to it. So this is a next generation antibody drug conjugate. It's got more of a payload uh, and it's directed to that tumour cell. But then the fact that it's got a cleavable linker means that it releases the chemotherapy and that chemotherapy can kill that cancer cell that exhibits the biomarker, but also distributes to the nearby cells uh, for that bystander effect uh, that was mentioned earlier. Uh, and this is quite important when you have tumour heterogeneity. The design of the Destiny Breast 04 trial was TDXD compared with treatment of physician's choice. But I actually think that treatment of physician's choice were some very reasonable options uh, for this population of patients, and they were actually fairly uh, heavily pre-treated. 
they were a group of patients who had a lot of visceral disease. Progression-free survival by um, uh, blinded independent, independent clinical review, um, central review, sorry, um, in the hormone receptor positive population was the primary endpoint. And here you can see on the left uh, is the hormone receptor positive and all patients. Now, 10% of these patients were triple negative, uh, or sorry, hormone receptor negative. Uh, and uh, HER2 positive by our traditional cutoffs were excluded from this trial. And the benefit is still there. Overall survival, uh, again, so we see about a six and a half month improvement in overall survival uh, based on this HER2 low. And that means that it's changed our current paradigm where we have perhaps 65% of patients who are hormone receptor positive, HER2 negative, 15% of patients who are triple negative, and I understand that that percentage is higher in uh, the Bangladeshi population, through to 50% of patients who have a HER2 low phenotype and who may benefit from trastuzumab, druxtecan, and potentially a range of new antibody drug conjugates. So those metastatic patients uh, do have benefits uh, from this approach. And so we have a new algorithm for defining HER2 low, looking at IHC and then offering those patients with HER2 low who have an IHC2 plus ish negative or IHC1 plus uh, the trastuzumab druxtecan. Now this drug, of course, also works very well in the HER2 positive patients, um, and you can see a waterfall plot here, which is pretty much all of the patients experiencing um, tumour shrinkage or stability. Uh, we need to uh, be aware of pneumonitis, and with uh, awareness of pneumonitis, we do have, um, we can stop treatment early, manage it, and then um, that's it's less likely to lead to severe outcomes. In the HER2 positive population, the progression-free survival, overall survival is improved. On the HER2 positive, again, uh, we have tucatinib. Now, tucatinib um, has, is a small molecule tyrosine kinase inhibitor and uh, directed against HER2 inhibiting downstream activation. It controls brain metastases and this is a time when tucatinib, I think, really comes into its own is in patients who have brain metastases. And we've seen trials demonstrating that patients with untreated brain metastases have durable control uh, with tucatinib. Survival is increased um, and the um, brain metastases are uh, well controlled as we've seen with um, the, uh, the tucatinib studies. HER3 is another biomarker that's not yet ready for prime time, uh, but there is um, overexpression in 30 to 50% of breast cancers associated with a poor prognosis. And patrichumab deruxtecan, which you'll notice the deruxtecan uh, is the same payload to trastuzumab deruxtecan, uh, and it's a similar um, antibody drug conjugate where there is phase one, two data showing that there is a good response rate to those HER3 positive. And so this is giving us another group of patients who we can identify for targeted approaches. We've talked about ESR1 uh, as a resistance marker to aromatase inhibition uh, and to tamoxifen. And this may be either de novo or acquired under selective pressure. It is unusual as a completely de novo um, change, but 20 to 40% of estrogen receptor positive breast cancer after first line will have ESR1 alterations. Fulvestrin is effective, as shown in the EFFECT and SOFIA trial, and there are oral SERDs in development. We've seen some changes. We've seen um, that some of these um, SERDs have been pulled from the market uh, and the companies aren't um, continuing with it, their development, but there are still um, some SERDs that are in active development. Adding everolimus to an aromatase inhibitor is another strategy that can overcome um, that ESR1 alteration. With the PADA1 trial, uh, the addition um, 
of um, fulvestrant or change from an AI to fulvestrant on emergence of an ESR1 mutation uh, does lead to a progression-free survival advantage, uh, although you are using up all of your agents earlier. And so I will wait to see the longer-term follow-up of the PADA1 trial. PIC3CA uh, is another one um, that with the SOLAR1 trial has shown that there is an advantage to alpelacib uh, for those 40% of patients with hormone receptor positive, HER2 negative metastatic breast cancer. Uh, and this um, contributes to endocrine resistance. If we look at uh, the intent to treat PIK3CA altered population, uh, we can see a benefit with alpelacib, whereas with the PIK3CA wild type there isn't. And this can be seen on circulating tumour DNA uh, as well as with next generation sequencing. Uh, and that remains beneficial in patients with altered genes that suggest CDK4-6 inhibitor resistance. Moving on to the triple negative biomarkers. So in metastatic triple negative breast cancer, uh, we know that there's an advantage um, to pembrolizumab. In the Impassion 130, there was an advantage with the tezolizumab, but that wasn't seen in Impassion 131. And there's conjecture about whether it's the chemotherapy backbone or not, whether it's the NAB paclitaxel versus paclitaxel. Um, but PDL1 must be positive for the metastatic first line setting. And it should be given in the first line before the immune system has a chance to get exhausted. These uh, are specific to the PDL1 stain. And so the drug um, needs to be prescribed based on the right PDL1 marker. Whether it's SP142, uh, CPS, uh, they all need to uh, be specific because they're not, uh, they don't necessarily overlap. So SP142 with atezolizumab, 22C3 with pembrolizumab, and SP263 with devalumab. And the cut points of these vary. The other thing to note with the biomarkers is that PDL1 varies substantially by the tissue of origin. So if you're going to get a biopsy looking for PDL1, liver and bone are low PDL1 organs, whereas if you look at lymph nodes, uh, lung, they're more likely to be PDL1 positive. And there may be discrepancy between the primary tumour and uh, the biopsy of a distant metastasis. PDL1 in early stage triple negative breast cancer does not predict for immunotherapy effect. So you don't actually need the PDL1 for um, those patients who are receiving neoadjuvant pembrolizumab. And so here you can see the forest plots indicating there's a benefit, whether they're PDL1 positive or negative. A time when we're increasing the number of patients who are having genomic and genetic testing. So germline testing for BRCA1 and 2 is well worthwhile for patients in the metastatic setting to see whether they can access uh, the PARP inhibitor Olaparib, uh, which does have uh, a, an improvement in overall survival in patients in the first line setting. Olympia is the early stage trial, and I think this is going to lead to more patients receiving neoadjuvant chemotherapy, particularly for hormone receptor positive disease, because there's a time there that you can test for the BRCA gene before they have surgery, because a BRCA gene alteration has the potential to alter the surgical decision making, as we've just heard, um, but it also has the potential to um, give additional options in the adjuvant setting uh, with a laparib. And the Olympia trial shows improvement in invasive disease free survival. 50% of patients on that trial had neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And there was no difference in quality of life. Another concern um, has been the long-term uh, outcomes from adjuvant, of these adjuvant agents. So if you've got a laparib, are they going to get myelodysplasia later? We haven't seen that in the longer-term follow-up um, of these patients. Uh, and we need to know more about fertility effects uh, from um, these novel agents being used in the adjuvant and neoadjuvant setting. So the effects of immunotherapy, if they're given neoadjuvant and adjuvant, 
on the thyroid, uh, on the pancreas, there can be some long-term effects that need to be borne in mind. So overall survival on Olympia at 3.5 years of median follow-up, there is a 3.8% absolute increase in survival. Trope 2 for sasituzumab govotecan is uh, the testing of trope 2 is not required as a predictive biomarker because it's almost ubiquitously expressed uh, and the drug is effective in essentially um, all patients in the triple negative and now we've seen uh, patients who have hormone receptor positive disease also have a benefit there uh, and we've seen these um, kaplan meier curves already uh, and the benefit is uh, across subtypes, uh, and so there's no significant differences there. And this is the Tropics 02 um, compared to treatment of physicians' choice that was presented at ASCO this year and followed up at ESMO. Tumor infiltrating lymphocytes are a fairly simple prognostic biomarker that can be looked at on IHC. So I think tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, and you, there's a website which trains pathologists called TILS in Breast Cancer that's been developed by Shireen Loy and Roberto Sagardo, and, uh, and that is aiming to prevent the problems that we've seen with the um, development of key 67 in the heterogeneity of results so that we can have standardization of TILS. Uh, and so TILS may allow de-escalation of adjuvant therapy. We need trials to look further into that. Uh, and there is potential for greater immunotherapy impact. Genomic testing, uh, we have seen some results uh, last year with the Rx Bonder trial. Uh, in the postmenopausal population, it indicates that there are patients who can have chemotherapy emitted uh, who are po um, node positive, one to three nodes. In the premenopausal patients, that who had a oncotype test who were node positive, N1, there wasn't a group that they could identify that could have chemotherapy safely omitted. Does this mean that all patients who are premenopausal who um, have lymph node positive disease need adjuvant chemotherapy? No. It just means that the test wasn't good enough for them. And it makes sense because Oncotype wasn't trained on premenopausal patients. Hopefully the Optima trial will give us more information there and that's currently in recruitment. Looking at circulating tumor DNA guided therapy in metastatic breast cancer, um, there is the plasma match study. Now this came up with um, a conclusion that we can use this to identify patients. But if you look at the numbers, there were 1,051 patients registered. There were 357 with a targetable alteration. 136 entered a treatment cohort. And of those, there was a 6% response rate in the ESR1 mutant, 25% response rate in the HER2 mutant, 18, um, so 22% response rate in AKT. So it's actually a fairly modest number of patients who are benefiting in the end for this. So I think that we need to get better at um, finding those targets. So in conclusion, the triplet of ERPR and HER2 remain the most clinically relevant actionable biomarkers. And having a good dialogue with our pathologists means that we're able to understand the nuances of this. And this comes into our MDT discussion, looking at the pathology um, and working out which treatment uh, pathway these patients are best suited to. ESR1 mutation um, is relevant. PIK3CA uh, may identify patients for alpelacib, the HER2 low for trastuzumab deruxtecan, BRCA1 and 2 uh, relevant to the PARP inhibitors, and PDL1 in metastatic triple negative, but is not needed for early stage. And so with that, I'll close. Uh, and I think we're running a little bit over time.